My talk is really going to be to discuss what is pulmonary fibrosis and why is it important. And I think the real thing that makes this difficult for both patients and providers um, is for a couple of different reasons. And the first is that we're dealing with a relatively uncommon condition. So unlike diabetes and heart disease or cancer, where the medical terminology is pretty easy to access, pulmonary fibrosis is a condition that most people haven't heard of until they are given the diagnosis. So we're dealing with an uncommon condition. And second, um, for some reason, our community has decided to make the terminology quite complex. So there are multiple different words that we have used to describe patients with pulmonary fibrosis, usual interstitial pneumonia, desquamative interstitial pneumonia, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. Because, and so this makes it a very uh, difficult um, disease to try and explain. So my goal today in the first half of the talk is really to get down to the basics and talk about what is pulmonary fibrosis. So generally speaking, there are three major terms that we use to describe pretty much the same thing. So pulmonary fibrosis is the same as interstitial lung disease, and that is also used in the scientific li literature as diffuse parenchymal lung disease. And these terms are really an umbrella term. It's an umbrella term that uh, encompasses over 100 different conditions. And people like myself and others on our panel, really the goal of our job is to figure out which of these 100 diseases you have. So if we look at pulmonary fibrosis as an umbrella term, they've categorized different causes of pulmonary fibrosis in this manner. So the first major category of pulmonary fibrosis are those new due to a known cause. So things like an autoimmune condition, so scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, myositis, we know that as part of this systemic disease process, patients can develop pulmonary fibrosis. Environmental causes are, are also a very important cause of pulmonary fibrosis, so exposures to birds and bird feathers or molds, things like that. This leads to the disease called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And finally, drugs, medications that patients take, uh, herbal supplements, things like that, those can all lead to drug toxicity and pulmonary fibrosis. The second major group of diseases are those that we attribute to an unknown cause. And this is where our poster child really pops up, which is called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF. There are actually seven different diseases in this unknown cause category. Among those include nonspecific interstitial pneumonia and a bunch of other acronyms that lead to our reputation as being an alphabet soup kind of group. But the most important ones I've listed here, of course, are IPF. The third major category are granulomatous conditions such as sarcoidosis, and the last category is what I tell my patients is my you know, garbage can category. It doesn't fit nicely into my other categories, and these include things like lymphangioliomyomatosis, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, and eosinophilic pneumonia. And really, the reason why these group of diseases, seemingly unrelated, are grouped together are based on a single unifying feature, and that includes varying amounts of inflammation and scarring of the lung. So getting back to why we refer to it as pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary, of course, means related to the lung, and fibrosis basically means thickening and scarring. So when we say pulmonary fibrosis, we're referring to thickening and scarring of the lung. And so here is a depiction of the lung anatomy. So on the left-hand side, you can see the trachea, which is the windpipe that you can feel here through your neck, the right lung, and the left lung. And when I explain the lung anatomy to my patients, I basically describe it as an upside-down tree. So you have the major branch, uh, or the trunk, that goes off to the right side and the left side. And all of these um, branches keep uh, dividing and dividing until they get to the very end where the leaves are. And if you look at the lung anatomy, it does the exact same thing. So you have the main trunk that goes off to the right and the left side. I don't know if I have a pointer. Oh, yeah, here we go. And they all keep dividing, and they keep dividing and dividing and dividing until you get to the very end where you meet these little grape sac-like clusters, cl clusters that we refer to the alveoli. And these alveoli are really the workhorse of the lung, and they are um, covered by this little network of blood vessels called capillaries. 
So if you take a real big close-up of this alveoli with the capillary network or blood network on top of them, this is what happens under normal conditions. The person breathes in the air, it gets all the way down into the alveolus, and then blood that's pumped from the right side of the heart gets through these little capillary networks. It delivers carbon dioxide that gets uh, the patient breathes out, and then the oxygen that is breathed in gets transferred into the capillary network, and that's how you provide oxygen to the rest of your body. Now, in the setting of fibrosis, these little X's are meant to reflect inflammation or scarring. There is impairment of the oxygen from going from the alveolus into the capillary bed. And so this is the real consequence of having a pulmonary fibrosis condition is oxygen can't get from the air into the blood. And so this is another way to look at it. You have the normal condition here in which oxygen that you breathe in through the air can easily pass across the alveolar membrane right into the bloodstream. But when you have a process that leads to scarring or inflammation of that alveolar membrane or next to it, the oxygen can't pass as easily into the bloodstream. The other consequence of pulmonary fibrosis, it leads to stiff lungs. So in normal circumstances, when you take a deep breath in, the lung is very compliant, and you can breathe in a lot of air, which allows more oxygen to come into the lung. In a fibrotic or scarred lung, that lung is stiff. And so when you try to take a dip, big deep breath in, you can't get in as much air as someone who has normal lungs. And so the amount of oxygen that actually gets into the lung is lower. So now I've told you what pulmonary fibrosis is. How can my doctors tell if I have pulmonary fibrosis? And for those of you who attended the session this morning, it's actually challenging for doctors to tell if you have pulmonary fibrosis and for a variety of different reasons. But here are some of the tests that we use to determine if you have pulmonary fibrosis. So of course, symptoms and signs. The problems with symptoms and signs of pulmonary fibrosis is they are really nonspecific. There's no cardinal feature that says, aha, this patient has pulmonary fibrosis. So symptoms can range from being asymptomatic to having a chronic cough or a cold that just won't go away, something that my patients have told me, a progressive shortness of breath, fatigue, and a decrease in exercise tolerance. And signs in your doctor's office that might suggest this is um, having a low oxygen saturation on the pulse oximeter, either at rest or with activity. The physician can hear crackles on examination, or you might have a phenomenon of, called clubbing of the fingers. The next major test that we look at to help us decide if someone has pulmonary fibrosis is your lung function. And I'm sure many of you have heard all of these terms before. But basically, there are two main metrics that we look at on a pulmonary function test that tell us how um, significant is the lung uh, impairment related to pulmonary fibrosis. So the first is the forced vital capacity, or FVC. And this is often reduced in patients who have pulmonary fibrosis. And basically, this is the measure that um, tells you how much air you can blow out. So it's when the respiratory tech is saying, keep going, keep going, keep going until you can't breathe out any more air. That is the measure that we are doing with the force vital capacity. And then the diffusing capacity is that marker that I showed you where the oxygen from the air is trying to get into the bloodstream. So it directly measures how well your lungs are able to transfer oxygen. So this is called the DLC, or diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide. And it's really the trends in the FVC and DLCO that your physician probably um, talks to you about at follow-up visits. So the next major thing is imaging. Now, high-resolution CT scan has really changed the way we diagnose uh, patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And basically, this is the CT scanner where you sit in a big tube, and we take slices or pictures of your lung in different segments um, throughout the chest. And um, through a lot of research, we've actually been able to determine the cause of pulmonary fibrosis just using the CT scan alone in up to 50% of cases. So this has really changed the way we diagnose patients with uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Now this is an example of two different CT scans. The one here on the left is that of a normal lung, and the one here on the right is someone with pulmonary fibrosis. And what you can see here in the normal lung is that it's mostly black. That's the air in the lung. You see little white dots and little white lines. Those are the blood vessels. Now in contrast, you can see someone who has pulmonary fibrosis in which you have these thick, irregular white lines, some areas of more solid white, and these kind of irregular holes that look like um, little cysts. So this is what we identify as 
pulmonary fibrosis by CT scan. And finally, lung biopsy. In some patients, we do require lung biopsy to determine the underlying cause. So which one of those several different diseases do you have? So this is what normal lung tissue looks under um, uh, on a, uh, under a microscope. And you can see these really thin lines here are those alveolar sacs, so those little grape sacs that I talked to you about before. In cases of pulmonary fibrosis, these little Thin line sacs are replaced by dense areas of collagen or scar and sometimes inflammation. So now I've told you what pulmonary fibrosis is, and then now I'm going to talk to you about why pulmonary fibrosis is a problem. And actually, I'm probably not the best qualified person to talk to you about this. Any one of you could probably give this part uh, better than I can. But when I thought about this, I thought about um, these three main things. So pulmonary fibrosis is a problem because it affects how you feel, function, and survive. So of course, you guys are no strangers to the symptoms of um, pulmonary fibrosis, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, depression, anxiety, and quality, uh, decreased quality of life. Jeff Swigris actually did a study um, where he interviewed patients with IPF and uh, you know, wrote a report about how patients actually feel when they have pulmonary fibrosis. And I pulled out a couple kind of telling quotes. Um, it's like preaching to the choir here today, but <laughs> really kind of describe how these symptoms affect um, how you feel. So cough, a nagging desire to cough constantly and never feeling relieved after coughing. Um, the dyspnea component, brushing my teeth is an exertion, carrying groceries or carrying anything at all is really uh, leads to shortness of breath. And then the exhaustion piece, separate from the shortness of breath, overwhelming fatigue, a lack of energy, and com feeling completely wiped out. So then, of course, pulmonary fibrosis can affect how you function, how you exercise, what hobbies and recreational activities you're able to do, um, your ability to ability to work, uh, memory loss, and your social interactions. Again, from this same paper, um, some of the things that I didn't realize until I read this paper and spoke more to my patients about this were things like forethought, having to plan, analyze every single activity. How far away is that parking lot from the door? Am I going to make it? Social participation, especially with that cough, you know, telling someone next to you on the airplane that what you have is not contagious, the fear of catching something, um, keeping up with relationships because you're not able to participate in a conversation. And then finally, I think the hard thing for patients with pulmonary fibrosis is the beginning to lose your independence. So becoming dependent on your caregiver, um, the people around you, your support network, that can be really hard for patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And finally, <clears throat> pulmonary fibrosis is important because it affects how you survive. It affects your prognosis, your qual qual uh, quantity of life. It puts you at risk for things like acute exacerbation that require hospitalization, and it um, requires lung transplantation in certain circumstances. So in 1998, there was this study published in which they looked at um, the life expectancy of patients with pulmonary fibrosis compared to expected. So to orient you all here, this is a time on the x-axis, so years after diagnosis. And this is percent surviving after your diagnosis. And what you can see, this is what people expect you to do over time, dying from other causes not related to pulmonary fibrosis. But those who have pulmonary fibrosis have a marked reduction in their life expectancy. In addition, in the same paper, they actually looked at different causes of pulmonary fibrosis. So if you look at patients who have usual interstitial pneumonia or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis versus nonspecific interstitial pneumonia or other forms of pulmonary fibrosis, you can see you have slightly different um, uh, survival curves depending on the underlying diagnosis, which is why we focus so very closely on determining the precise cause of the pulmonary fibrosis. 
So pulmonary fibrosis is a problem. I hope um, I didn't have to explain to you, of course, how it affects how you feel, function, and survive. But on top of that, it affects one out of every 200 adults over the age of 65 in the United States. There's approximately 50,000 new cases each year of pulmonary fibrosis. And this number is likely to increase over time because we've learned that IPF is a disease of the aging population. And as our population ages, we're going to see more and more cases of IPF. And 40,000 Americans die from IPF each year. So pulmonary fibrosis is a problem. But I hope uh, none of you in this room are discouraged. There is reason to hope. And uh, the session this morning, I think, is just a slight drop in the bucket of what is possible. So in 2014, uh, two treatments were approved for IPF, first time ever. It was a major year for, for our community. And now there is growing international interest in finding better treatments and potentially a cure for this group of conditions. And there are increasing resources from foundations, support groups, and universities to provide better education education to both patients and providers, counseling in terms of genetics and end-of-life care, and building support networks. So I think there is reason to hope, and I think that um, a lot of the people are here at this summit meeting, and I think we will continue to learn more as the conference progresses. And that's it. <laughs>